Last week, not last week, a couple weeks ago, last week um, we didn't have church, so uh, two weeks ago um, I got sidetracked from this lesson talking about something else the whole morning. So this is the third time I keep printing it out with new dates on it that I printed these notes out. So let's see how we can handle them today. So the week before that, we talked uh, in Second Peter one ten to twelve about making our calling and election sure. And I'm not going to spend a great time on review here, a great amount of time. Uh, just um, he told us to make it sure, and so I got into the commentaries and we discussed some things uh, about what does that mean? How can I make my calling to be a Christian sure? Now commentaries have differing opinions on that. Uh, that but make my calling an election sure. Uh, the most prevalent point, the differences aren't on doctrine. The difference is in exactly what he's talking about here. But this idea, if we think about salvation, there's nothing I can do to make my salvation surer than what God has already done. He who begun a good work in me will perform it till the day of his appearing. That's the Word of God. He's the author and the finisher of my faith. The one who got me started is the one that's going to get me home. And uh, so, the commentators, uh, with a rare exception, um, all believe he's not talking about me making certain I'm saved. But rather, he's talking... Uh, some believe that uh, the, the intent of Peter is live your life in a way that shows those around you the real, that you're the real deal. So that you can be a witness to them. Jesus said something to that effect. He said, I'm going to give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. The Old Testament was love yourself, uh, your neighbor as yourself. Jesus upped the ante. Now Jesus said... Love your fellow believers the way I love you. That's a tall order. He loves me with perfect love. So he's telling me to love uh, my Christian brothers and sisters the very way he loves me. So he said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, my followers. This is the way they'll know you're the real deal. So Peter over here, who was in that room when Jesus said that, in the upper room... Um, Peter says, make your calling and election sure. Live a way that those around you will know you're the real deal. Because they're not going to listen to your witness if they're not convinced you're genuine in your faith. So that's one opinion. The other is, live a way that will convince you you're the real deal. Because sometimes, even though God saved us from the uttermost, from the guttermost to the uttermost, uh, the devil is always trying to attack us. And we can have days we wonder if we're saved. So uh, even though God, he will begin a good work in us, will perform it till the day of its appearing. So I think it was David Guzik who said, live your life in a way that convinces you you're the real deal. So, and by the way, John, who was also in that room when Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that being you love each other the way Jesus loved you. John talked about, a lot about it in First John 4. And he's talking about, uh, um, if I can't love you folk, how can I claim to love God? And John's argument is this. John's argument is, I can't see God. I can see you. So if I have the ability not to love, I don't love somebody I see, how can I be sure I'll love the one I don't see? The only way I can be certain that I love him is by loving his children. That's what John teaches in First John 4. So we're to live our lives in a way that uh, our conduct verifies our, our witness. And... Uh, so now we're going to drop down. I'm going to, uh, you got the sheet there. You can look at that other stuff you want, but I want to get in today's lesson. He went on with verse 13. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, he's talking about his human body, 
as long as I'm in this human body, it's in essence what he's saying. Um, as you can see in the other trend, the modern translation under it, as long as I live, as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So he had talked uh, the week before about how he wanted people to remember certain things and how he is reminding him. And he said, I know you already know, but I'm going to keep reminding you. Um, Sometimes we know stuff, but it becomes dormant in us, and so we need to remind it of those things. Intellectually we know it, but we don't know it practically in the sense that it's happening in our lives. So we need to be stirred up by remembrance. He said, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep remembering that. But then he says something. Now, this week's lesson is an eyewitness of his glory. He said this in verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, or this my human body, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. The New International Version of verses 13 and 14 above read this way. I think it is right to refresh your memory as, as long as I live in the tent of, of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus has made clear to me. So he's saying Jesus revealed to him something about his dying. So, let's look back to the last chapter of the Gospel of John. John 21, beginning with verse 17. Jesus had found the disciples. This was after his resurrection. He had been dead three days, then he resurrected, appeared to the disciples in the uh, upper room, and uh, let them touch him, see that he was uh, indeed alive, wasn't a ghost. And now, after that, they're out fishing, caught nothing all night. Now, some of them are trained fishermen, not all of them, but some of them. If they fished all night and caught nothing, I don't think God was showing off. They didn't catch a thing. I think that was part of God's plan. Because then Jesus appeared to them on the shore, and they were close enough now, they were pulling the nets up to come to shore. Jesus was close. I mean, they didn't just shoot some, some good bait and throw the line out. They used nets. When the boat goes along, it catches everything in that net under the boat. And they hadn't caught anything all night. So Jesus said, Hey, before you come in, cast your net on the other side. And they said, Well, we've been trying this all night. But they had learned when Jesus says something, it's good advice. So he threw the net on the other, they threw the net on the other side and got so many fish, the net almost broke trying to pull them into the boat. Is that God showing off or what? Didn't let him catch a single fish with a net. And then he tells them to throw it on the other side. They hadn't caught it on this side with the net. So the boat's what? So wide. So they threw it on the other side. And now there were so instantly so many fish in that net they couldn't hardly pull it out of the water. But they come to shore, Jesus, you know, Peter, um, shortly before Jesus was arrested and crucified, very shortly. Matter of fact, it was that day that they arrested him. Jesus told Peter, you know, some of you are going to forsake me, talking about his disciples. Peter said, I don't care what they do, Lord, I'll die with you. And Jesus said, before the cock crows, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times. Peter thought, no way. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. The soldiers come and arrest him. Jesus follows, or Peter follows at a distance. And when he gets close to where the um, chief priest and others are interrogating Jesus, People say, you're one of his disciples. And he said, oh no, they're going to arrest me too. And he said, no, I'm not. And they said it, somebody else said a little bit later, 
I seen you following him. No, no, not me. And a third time, somebody said, I know you're one of his followers. And with cursing, he denied it. Now, uh, I don't know if that means cursing the way we use the word. It, it could have meant that uh, uh, he was simply swearing in some way, but he was denying it. I don't know. You don't read about the word cursing in the Bible ever meaning profanity. So I'm not sure it meant it there. But he denied it but he way three times. You know what happened after he denied him the third time? The rooster crowed. And this is one of the most moving stories in all the New Testament to me. Because we all got a little bit of Peter in us. He went out and wept bitterly. I tell you, there are times I think, God, I can't believe. What we need to understand about a relationship with Jesus, this is a love affair. Jesus isn't a casual acquaintance. He's someone we want to please. Like a romance. Romances that are healthy. The woman wants to please the man. The man wants to please the woman. That's what this is supposed to be. We're supposed to do things that we think will please him, not try the edges. So he went out and wept bitterly. And uh, But I wanted to read what happened uh, at that, when the boat was out after Jesus had resurrected. Uh, down here in um, John at the bottom of the page, 21 verses 17 to 22. He, that being Jesus, saith unto him the third time. He'd already asked him this twice. If you, I could have included the whole thing, but you only got so much uh, room and time. So um, he said the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, loveth thou me... Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Loveth thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. The first two times he said yes. And he said, Feed my lambs. Now what was Jesus trying to get at? He finally asked him the third time and Peter was grieved. And his answer instead of yes, before he said yes, was, Thou knowest all things. Now, why is that an important answer? When Jesus said, Peter, you're all going to forsake me tonight. Peter said, not me. I'll die with you. Jesus wanted Peter to understand, Peter, I know you better than you know you. And when he got to that point, he said, feed my sheep. And then they had another conversation going on. He went on to say in verse 18, Verily I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he, Peter, should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. So he's had this conversation three times, saying, Do you love me? And finally, on the third time, he said, You know. He said, Feed my lamb. Then he said, and Then he began to prophesy about a future time when he goes from being young, probably in his upper 20s, younger 30s, to when he was old. How many of you know if you live long enough, you're going to get old? And I know, been there, done that. And um, really, I'm only middle age. I plan on living to be 142. But uh, anyway, that's what I'd have to live to to be at middle age right now. But um, so he says, you know, Peter, right now you're young. You can go where you want. He said, there's going to come a time when you're not even dressing yourself. Someone's going to put on a certain apparel for you and stretch out your arms. Now, we know this, that he was prophesying about Peter's death. We don't know 
if it depicts crucifixion. But we're strongly convinced, when I say we, uh, people who study these things and the commentators, that there's a pretty good chance he's prophesying that Peter is going to be crucified. For one thing, that became a favorite way for Romans to kill Jews. Crucifixion. By 70 A.D., uh, when the Jews had had an uprising, tried to overthrow Roman uh, power uh, in their uh, country, thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews were crucified. So there's a good chance that's exactly what he meant. But we don't know for certain. I can't tell you that. I can tell you that tradition, whenever you read a commentary, and the, and the commentator uses the word tradition, they're talking about handed down from one generation to the next generation stories. In other words, those like Josephus and others, well, Josephus was more of a contemporary, those who uh, were telling stories about the first century church, say in the second century, were saying this, and maybe it got handed down, and somebody was recording, got handed down to the third century. They call that tradition. We can't prove, it's not in the Word of God, that Peter was crucified. But we do know that the statement Jesus gave was concerning what way he would die. Now, when you're old, you're going to die until Jesus descends with a shout. There's only one way off the planet right now. How many of you would like to be in heaven someday? At the moment, there's only one way to get there, and that's to die. Again, Charles Stanley's uh, son was preaching on his radio program one time and said, I'm not afraid to be dead because I know that when I'm dead, I'm in heaven. He said, what bothers me is getting dead. And I think that's a common thing in all of us. We don't like the process of dying. Um, So he's not simply telling Peter, when you're old, you're going to die. That's true about everybody. If the Lord tarries, there's going to be a bunch of old people to go to heaven in the rapture. Um, But there are a lot of those people who have already died who thought they'd be alive for the rapture. And it hadn't worked out for him. So anyway, he's telling them that. So, then Peter went on, wanting to change the subject. He, in verse 20, Peter turning about saith unto the disciple whom Jesus loved following, um, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? In the communion table, the night uh, Jesus was betrayed, before he was betrayed, but the night Judas went out, um, John just had this unusual love for Jesus. And when they were all reclining, he put his head on Jesus' chest. And uh, uh, we can't do that nowadays. We think a man putting his head on a man's chest is weird. Uh, Not so weird anymore, but for a different reason than what it used to not be weird uh, for. But anyway, um, Jesus spoke to him. Uh, I mean, Peter brought John up. Because Jesus had said something to him. Uh, Peter, uh, seeing him, said to the Lord, And what shall this man do? In other words, when's John going to die? And Jesus said in verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, Peter, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. So much in there. But he's telling Peter, It's none of your business what I do with John. You follow me. And boy, is that a lesson we all need to learn. We wonder why God's blessing this guy so much. Lord, you still know my address? What about me, Lord? And Jesus answers us, it would be what it was to Peter. What's that to you? You follow me. Your chore as my child is to follow me. That's your chore. All right, put that over if you would. And... uh, so, Jesus told him when he was young that he would die when he was old. And I brought out the part, uh, there is a tradition. One of the stories handed down through the generation was that 
when they were going to crucify Peter, he didn't think he was worthy to die the way Jesus did. So he asked him to crucify him upside down. And so tradition said he got crucified, but with his head down. And again, um, we have no historian who wrote that down, nothing of that nature. So that's why we call it tradition. It was something that the early church in the second, third, gener- uh, third, second, third century, whatever, uh, it's what they were talking about. And so that's why it's a possibility. We do know that Jesus has said part of your death is going to be they're going to stretch out your arms. So that makes it a little hard. They had to turn the whole cross upside down if they did that to stretch out his arms, which wouldn't have been a problem. All right. Verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor... This is Peter talking again now to the people he's writing to. His reaction with Jesus, uh, we're done with that. So I don't want you to get this uh, confused. Now, Peter says to his readers, Moreover, I will endeavor that you be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So he's back there. I'm going to tell you this stuff over and over and over. Even when you're doing it good, I'm going to tell you again. Because when I die, I can't tell you anymore. And I want you to always, when I'm gone, I still want to minister to you. Now, how can I minister to you when I'm gone? You're going to remember what I told you. Because I'm going to remind you over and over and over again. All right? Now, Ephesians 4, 11, 13 there. 11 to 13. Paul writes, And he, God, gave some, talking about the churches, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. What for? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what was Peter doing? He was doing his ministry. God had given him to the church to perfect him, them, to perfect everybody he's writing to, to help them mature, not to make them perfect in the way you think perfect, uh, but to make them, the Greek word for perfect, usually means fullness, like when a flower blooms. That flower is now perfect. Um, Reaching maturity is usually the idea behind biblical perfection. And so, the Bible says that God gave all these different types of ministers for the same purpose to help the church people grow spiritually. To help them become spiritually mature. Why does God want the church people to become spiritually mature? Uh, Here He tells us, so they can work the ministry. So they can edify each other. God wants you to grow up spiritually so you can help the guy sitting next to you to grow up spiritually. So, the job of the ministry isn't just to preach and bore you to death with stuff. It's to teach you stuff that helps you grow up in the Lord so you can help the person sitting next to you or behind you or in front of you or in the church across town. So you can help a believing friend grow. So you can share with them a message from the Word that was shared to you from a pulpit, you'd share it in a different way. If you're sharing with somebody at High B, you're probably not going to bring one of these in and stand it right up there by his table and share with them. John will tell you, I share at High B. I never bring this with me. But I think the others would say, what? You know what would scare them the most? If I brought this and made High B... Uh, cafeteria into a church server, they probably think, oh no, there's an offering coming. <laughs> so, anyway, that's why we teach over and over and over and over again to the saints. Because when we're not around them, they we want them to remember. That's why I put some doctrine in songs that I write. Because some people who don't remember well what I said, there's something about songs. That's why I wrote the song, The Big Red F. Reminds us of the gospel story. Um, The one that we sang this morning. 
On days when we do right, on days when we do wrong. I want you to remember always how radically, fanatically, relentlessly, continuously God loves you. I got those phrases from a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. So I thought I loved that phrase. He was saying throughout the book, God radically, fanatically, relentlessly, continuously loves you. And I thought, wow, I love that book. Love the book. I almost put it down after a chapter or two. I thought, oh, this guy, I think, is leaning toward um, universal salvation. And universal salvation is where, in the end, everybody goes to heaven. Would to God that was true. I would to God I could find that in here. I can't stand the thought of anybody not making heaven. But it's simply not a doctrine of Scripture. And in the second chapter, I think I know that's where he's going. I wanted to put it down. But then I got to reading what he said about God's love for his people. And I remembered he talked to a prophet through a donkey. If he could talk to a prophet through a donkey... He can talk to me through someone who I might not agree with on every point. And man, he talked to me so much I read two of his other books. Ah, I still think that's what he believes. But I tell you, he believes a whole lot about right of right stuff concerning how radically God loves you. And we need to be reminded of those things. And... uh, that way we can remind, we can teach. If we keep it in our remembrance, we can teach it. Finally, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, or the New Living Translation. We haven't made up clever stories. Uh, the easy to read version. These things were not just clever stories that people invented, all right? So he says, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now remember, this is uh, decades later. Jesus has been in heaven. Probably four decades later. And uh, the people he's writing to were saved and never seen Jesus. And he said, we didn't make this stuff up. We, Peter and the other disciples, eyewitnesses, we saw the whole thing. We heard things he said. We've seen the dead raised, the sick healed, the blind see, the deaf hear, the cripple walk. And we've seen all that. We've seen him die. And three days later, he visited us. Not only did he visit us, he came in the room we were in without knocking, and the door was locked. Have I told you this morning, God doesn't mind showing off? He walked in the room through the wall. Now, I don't know about you. I've never tried that. What I want you all to do after church is pick a wall and run real fast. See See if you can get through that sucker. Jesus doesn't mind showing up. Peter said, I and these other apostles and preachers are not telling you stuff we made up. We were eyewitnesses. See, never a bit of it. Can you imagine? They were there when a man had been dead for three days. Jesus, a friend of Jesus, Jesus said, roll that stone away. Some men rolled the stone away and he yelled into a grave. Lazarus, come forth. And this man was all bound up in wrappings. And he cripples his way out of that room, out of that tomb. Do you think Peter would forget that in 40 years? They stood on a mountain and watched him ascend off the ground into the sky, up past the clouds, and disappear. And then they had angels descend down, hover, 
and say the way he left, he's coming back. Jesus. Have I told anyone that he likes to show off? <laughs> you have. Amen. This is a glorious God, he said, we're first-hand witnesses. And that's what we want. That's why I titled the last verse, they were an eyewitness of his glory. These people were so certain of what they seen that every one of them was willing to die a martyr's death. John was the only one who didn't die a martyr's death, but not because they didn't try. Again, tradition tells us, we can't prove this, but the handed down stories of the first century church tells us that they boiled John in oil. The emperor of Rome you had a congress. How many of you know how much trouble congresses can be? Uh, they had a congress. And, um, oh, I'm sure congress oh, got along back in those days. But they had a congress that would remind emperors of rules. The emperor ordered John to be boiled in oil. oil this is the tradition. And when he wouldn't die... He was going to have somebody run run him through with the sword. But the Congress reminded him, if you carry out the death sentence, you can only do it once. So they, he didn't have a legal right to try... I mean, when people get boiled in oil, how many of you know they're supposed to die? And uh, so... Instead, he sentenced him to go to a prison, uh, the Isle of Patmos, which was a prison island. Now, why didn't God let him die when all the other disciples died? Because God wasn't through with him yet. Over there in the Isle of Patmos, when he was on a prison island, God gave him the book of Revelation. You know, I've written two commentaries. The commentary, a 300-page commentary in the book of uh, Galatians, another 300-page commentary on the book of First John. A little boy died and got me out of it. I started a third one. You know, it's like a diet. You do so well until you break it. I got out of the habit and never been able to get back in the habit. Um, but I keep thinking, maybe God wants me to write more commentaries. But I'm not in a hurry because I noticed John didn't die because he wasn't done writing. What if God wants me to write a third commentary? I think I'll drag my feet. Oh, well, anyway, that's just nonsense. But hey, in closing, before I pray, I just wanted to tell you one other thing and I'm going to remind you of this as long as I'm still alive in this body so that you'll remember it when I'm gone. God doesn't mind showing off. 